that we can come and meet together for a gospel meeting tonight. And we praise the Lord for how he's already helped us throughout this day. And we want to keep praising the Lord even together this evening. Let's pray together as we begin our time together tonight. Our Father in heaven, we come and we do bow once again before thy throne. And we thank thee for the goodness of the Lord's day. That thou hast set aside a day that is um, where we can come and we can bring our petitions unto thee. Where we can pray and meet together. Where we can remember first and foremost the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And thy word tells us that it was on the first day of the week that our Savior rose and showed that he is triumphant over death and over hell. And we come together and we meet together in that triumph. And we claim the name of Jesus Christ. And we desire to lift him up and to worship him and we pray that thou wouldst give us a lively worship this evening. That we might know the help and the grace that comes from the power of thy Holy Spirit. Please work in this meeting. Work freely and move amongst us, we pray. And we pray that Christ Jesus will be magnified in it. For we pray in his name. Amen. Let's sing together a hymn. If you would, take your hymn books and turn to hymn 289. M289, oh, what a Savior that he died for me. From condemnation he hath made me free. He that believeth on the Son, saith he, hath everlasting life. Savior that he died for me. From condemnation he hath made me free. He that believeth on the Son said he hath everlasting life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, the sun is true hath everlasting life all my iniquities on him were laid all my indebtedness by him was paid all who believe on him the Lord hath said hath everlasting life Seated. 
Let's take our Bibles together this evening. And let's turn in the Old Testament to the book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 6. We'll have just a brief reading from the scriptures this evening. So, but I hope you'll follow along in the word of God. 2 Kings chapter 6. And we'll read the first seven verses. And I've asked Gilbert to come along and read to us from the word of God this evening. Two Kings chapter six. And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick, and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee, and he put out his hand, and took it. So read God's word. Thank you very much. And of course, we'll be back in the book of Two Kings in a moment when we have our um, just when we have our Bible message in a few moments. Why don't we sing together once again? Uh, do take your hymn books tonight, and let's turn to hymn three hundred and seventy-five and sing another hymn together. Hymn three seventy-five. Tis the promise of God, full salvation to give. Aren't you glad? That God doesn't give us half salvation, that he doesn't meet us halfway, um, but he gives us full salvation unto him who on Jesus his son will believe. Let's sing and sing tonight. Tis the promise of God full salvation to give unto him who on Jesus his son will believe. Hallelujah, it is done. I believe on the Son. I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. Hallelujah, it is done. I believe I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. Though the pathway be lonely and dangerous too, surely Jesus is able to carry me through. Hallelujah, it is done. I believe on the Son. I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. Hallelujah, it is done. I believe on the Son. I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. Many loved ones have I safe now in glory and this is their song hallelujah it is done i believe on the sun i am saved by the blood of the crucified one hallelujah it is done i believe on the sun I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. There are prophets and kings in that throng I behold, and they sing while they march through the streets of pure gold. Hallelujah, it is done, I believe. 
I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. Hallelujah, it is done. I believe on the Son. I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. There's a part in that chorus for you and for me, and the theme of our praises forever will be. Hallelujah, it is done. I believe on the Son. I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. seated this evening and just want to give a few notices I mentioned several of these things this morning but we've got really a lot of things that are going on in the next few weeks I hope you'll pray for and remember them of course we're remembering the heritage bible conference that's coming up on the 25th the 26th and the 27th i know a number of people here in the church have already booked and some people are planning on going but haven't booked i won't make you raise your hands Again, we raised our hands this morning. If we hadn't booked, I had to raise my hand as well, by the way. But please do that in the next few days. If you're planning on going, there's options. You can book for all three days if you're able to go Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. There's also options to book for one day or for two days. And, um, and there's a cost breakdown on that as well. There's, there will be two meals provided, a lunch and a dinner every day um, during the conference. And so if, you, if you're able to register for that, That'll help us know um, and how to prepare and how many people to plan for, how much food to purchase, that sort of thing. So um, please help us in that if you're planning on going. And we're looking forward to the conference. We're planning on having um, um, a, a wonderful conference. Pastor Clarence Sexton from Crown College in the U.S. is planning on coming. And a number of other speakers is co are coming as well. We're, we are going to have um, resources available. We have vendors who are going to be coming uh, and setting up book stalls and resources as well. And it'll be a lovely time. There'll be activities available. Um, when there's not a meeting, there'll be activities going on for adults and for children. And I think you'll enjoy it. And I think it'll be a blessing to you as it's coming up um, here in a few weeks. And then just after the conference, on the 28th of August, that's a Sunday, we are planning on having the opening service of the new church plant in Crowborough, Jarvis Brook Baptist Church. Um, Carl and Charmaine have been down there really for a number of weeks doing outreach and inviting people and really we're praying for an opening meeting and so that's going to be during the Sunday evening service and so what we're going to do is we want to support that new work and so we'll, we're going to have a bit of a change to our normal Sunday schedule and so we're planning on we'll have our morning service at 11 and then after our morning service we'll have a meal together like we often do a, a quick meal and then we're going to load up in the minibus and maybe anyone else that wants to take a vehicle of course is welcome to do so we're going to drive down to Crowborough it's about a three hour drive and we're going to try to be there for that evening meeting and that opening service so we can pray together with other Christians and we can support that new work as it's getting started and God willing all being well um, Pastor Sexton plans on being there and giving the sermon for that opening service um, as well so it'll be a busy few days but we're looking forward to that and with those things going on our weekly schedule will continue to be somewhat altered so the homeless outreach is not going to go ahead until the until we get into the month of september so that'll that'll start again on the 2nd of september as well as the explorers bible club um, will be starting on that day um, as well also starting a few weeks after that on a friday we're trying um, to get a toddler group started up and I know a number of the ladies in the church have had a burden for that and um, we're, we'll, we'll try to get some organization and other things together as we get closer to that day but please remember that day the 16th of September on Friday morning we'll have a toddler group um, starting up also let's be in prayer for 
Um, the Crown Hall students will be joining us. It, it doesn't seem like it's been very long since they left, but we already have a new group of students who are going to be arriving. They'll be arriving um, next week, a week from Tuesday. All of the British students will arrive, and then a week from Wednesday, all of the American students will be coming over as well. Hope you'll pray for them, that there's no problems traveling and other things. And we're expecting all being well, the largest group of students we've ever had there at Crown Hall, both with some returning students and then new students coming from England and from Ireland and even some from the Netherlands and also a group of students coming from Crown College in the USA. And so that's coming up really very, very soon. I hope you'll begin praying um, for them. Also, um, we're having a special prayer meeting and Bible study this upcoming Tuesday. I'd encourage you to join us. Even if you don't normally come to a prayer meeting, I hope you'll come to this one at 6 p.m. This upcoming Tuesday, we're, we're going to be pleased to have uh, Mr. Graham Tudor from the Trinitarian Bible Society. He's going to come, and like he does every year, he's going to give a report on the work that the TBS has been involved in over the past year, uh, translating and printing and distributing the scriptures. It's a good work. And they're going to give a report about that. And also he's going to bring um, a message from the Word of God as well. He always comes and brings wonderful resources. He'll set up a table with books and Bibles and portions of Scripture and stationery with the Word of God on it. All sorts of different things. And I'd encourage you to come and, um, um, and to be ready um, for some of those things as well. So that's this Tuesday, 6 p.m. Not here in this building, but just a short distance away in our old building on Spring Road. And you can come along to that, and, um, and we're looking forward to a good uh, prayer meeting on that day. Also, I mentioned, um, and a few people have asked me about it, the, the folks at the Birmingham City Mission. Have their, you, you can tell they've been doing some cleaning out and some clearing out here in this building. And they've asked for some help over the next few weeks. And if you're available to help during any of these days, they would, and you wanted to come and meet, um, I think Catherine is going to be running it uh, from the Birmingham City Mission and overseeing kind of a cleanup and, a, and a, um, an overhaul of some things here. She could use your help on the 9th and the 10th of August. So that's this week, two days this week, and then the week after that on the 16th and the 17th of August. If you're at a loose end on one of those days and you'd like to come, you can just come here to the center. They'll be available kind of from mid-morning, and uh, you can help and lend a hand, and I'm sure they would appreciate the help. They've always been uh, very kind to us, and we're very grateful that they give us the opportunity to come and to meet in this building on a regular basis. And we're praying that door would uh, continue to remain open um, um, in the days and the weeks to come. Well, lots of notices that are going on, lots of different things going on. Maybe you say, oh, I'm very tired. I, I wish we could just have a long break from all of these conferences and students and all the things going on. No, we need to pray and find rest in the Lord and pray that for these opportunities God has given us. All being well, I'll bring a message in a moment really on that very topic. And I hope it'll be a help and encouragement. But let's pray for these things that are going on. We'll have a word of prayer together. And let's remember these many of these things in prayer. And then we'll take up a collection here in just a moment. I'd like to ask Joseph if he wouldn't mind to pray for us. And um, then once he's done, Benjamin, please come and take the collection tonight.
just before we come to our Bible message this evening, let's take our hymn books one more time. And let's turn to hymn 619. Hymn 619. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice on thee, my Savior, and my God. This is a great thing. It speaks about the day of conversion. Because I hope you, if you know Christ as your Savior, you can look back on the day Christ saved you. And you can look back with joy and gladness, can't you? And uh, we'll, we'll stand and sing this lovely hymn together. Oh, happy day that fixed my choice On thee, my Savior and my God Well, may this glory raptures all abroad. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray, and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, The great transactions done. I am my Lord's, and He is mine. He drew me, and I followed on, charmed to confess the voice divine. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Now rest my long divided heart Fixed on this blissful center rest, nor ever from my Lord depart, with him of every good possess. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. High heaven that heard the solemn vow that vow renewed shall daily hear, till in life's latest hour I bow, and bless in death upon so dear. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch and pray and live rejoicing every day. Happy day, happy day, when Jesus washed my sins away. Well, you may be seated. And I just want to bring a, a really a brief message from the Word of God this evening and um, from the book of 2 Kings chapter 6. Now I've preached on this passion and portion of Scripture before, so um, some of the things I have to say tonight may not be new or anything like that, but it's good Bible truth. And I want to really address and speak about um, really some things that are coming up and, and, and as a church family and as a ministry as a whole, 
We'll have new workers arriving, not this week, but the week after next. New students from Crown Hall and many people coming in. That's going to be a lot of new names to learn. Maybe if you're like me, you have a hard time when a new group of people come in. You have a hard time learning and remembering everyone's names. And um, this is, in many ways, we're a part of what many might consider a very unusual church. In that we're a church that is continually supporting a larger ministry. And on the other side of that coin, we're supported by, in many ways, a larger ministry. We, we, we work together with other churches to see things like the, the Crown Christian Heritage Trust and Crown Hall and the Bible College and the camp and many of these other things going on. And we, in the midst of those things, we can praise God that in His goodness and in His wisdom, He's seen fit to let us be a part of a growing ministry. Growing as a church, growing as a camp, growing as a Bible college, and many other things. But I want to speak specifically this evening um, about some of the problems in a growing ministry. And I want to speak about some of these things because if we're not careful as Christian people, we can very easily become people who only ever see the problems. And we dwell on the negative, And we dwell on how things aren't right and how things should be better. And, um, and we, we greatly desire the Lord's blessing. And so I want to speak about really 2 Kings chapter 6. We get one of the, one of, an unusual account really in the life of Elisha. I've been reading through in my personal study a little bit the life of the prophet Elisha. And I think this is quite an unusual account that's given. But really it's an account that highlights the problems that result in a ministry that's growing. And there are many physical problems that might result. Look at the first verse. And the sons of the prophets... They said unto Elisha, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee, it's too straight for us. What's going on here? Well, the sons of the prophets, these were a group of young men. Most people believe they were mostly young men. Maybe some of them were older than others. They were a group of people. They were first, uh, they were first referred to during the days of Elijah, who came before Elisha. You remember Elijah, he stood before um, the nation on Mount Carmel and the fire came down. And shortly after that, he ran from the face of Jezebel and he went and found himself alone in the desert and he complained to God. Maybe you've made a similar complaint. He said, I am the only one that's left. And the Lord had to remind him, he said, wait a moment, you're not the only one that's left. I have reserved uh, the, a great number of people who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And these were those people, these sons of the prophets. And many, and during the days of Elijah, it was really, it was, we could against the law to be a Bible-believing believer, to follow the word of God. It was days of idolatry and days of wickedness. And so Obadiah, one of the king's servants who feared the Lord, took a, a large portion of these men who had not bowed the knee to, the, to, the, um, to Baal, and he hid them. And he began training them and bringing them up in the Word of God. And from that point on, really for the next several years, there was a group of people, and they were known as the sons of the prophets. And here we find uh, a lot of people believe that this is a great Old Testament example of what we might call today a Bible college, where people had left their homes, different young men had left their homes all over the nation of Israel, and they had gathered together in one place to be taught and trained in the Word of God. They were being trained in the office of a prophet. And after really the minute in really during and after the ministry of Elijah, they will be sent out to different cities and to different places to minister in the Word of God. It was a, maybe a primitive form, an Old Testament form of a Bible college. You see, by the way, you see a New Testament form of a Bible college in the book of Acts. When Paul hired out a hired hall in the book of Ephesus and he taught there for two years. And during that two years, laborers were sent all over Asia to preach the word of God. But there were problems that began to arise in this ministry. It was a growing ministry. And the prophets, they came to Elisha and they said, look, the place where we dwell, it's too straight for us. The house they were 
We don't know what kind of a house it was, how big or how small it was, but it was too small for them. There was not enough space. This is all, by the way, this is always a good problem to have. But it was a problem nonetheless, not enough space. We've seen that problem very recently in, in our church. What we're thank the Lord God's given us space now. It'd be great to come to the time where we looked at this building and we said it was too small for us. That's in the Lord's hands. We, we found it very evident this year. It, victory. If any of you who worked or helped at the camp thought and you saw, you know, 200 campers there on the property and trying and all the workers with them and trying to feed that many people with the kitchen facilities we have and trying to find space on the property, not only to put tents up, but also to have activities and games. It, maybe you thought like, like I did at some point this week. The place where we dwell, it's too, it's too straight for us. We could use more land. We could use a larger facility. We could use bigger this and bigger that. We, we are going to find that very soon. There's term at Crown Hall. We have the largest number of students that we've ever had, and we're trying to convert room. Where, where are the students going to sleep? Where are we going to put them? Do we have enough beds for everyone? There's problems that arise when you're engaged in this type of a work that sometimes you find there's not enough space. Maybe here in a few weeks time, God willing, when we find that we get workers from Crown Hall coming and working and laboring in your church, maybe you'll have some space issues. And you think these, these young people, they're getting in the way, they're eating all of our food, they're, 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 um, it, it's a problem. That was another problem they had, by the way, the sons of the prophets, they didn't have enough food oftentimes. Uh, turn back a few pages to chapter 4. You find another odd occurrence with these people. <laughs> chapter 4, verse 38, And Elisha came again to Gilgal. There was a dearth in the land, a famine, a time of shortage, a food shortage. Many people say we're, we're heading for those types of shortages today. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said unto his servant, Set out a great pot and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out and to gather into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered there of wild gourds his lapful and came and shred them into the pot to the pottage for they knew them not. And they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out, and they said, O oh, thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. We, we'll carry on reading. We can read the rest of it here in just a moment. You know what they found? They found there's not enough food. We've got all the sons of the prophets here. There's food shortages. The price of food had doubtless risen like it has in, in our nation over the past few months. And they thought, how are we going to feed all these people? He said, we've got a great pot here. How are we going to fill it to feed all the sons of the prophets? And they sent people out into the fields to gather herbs. I'm thankful we haven't gotten to that point yet. But there was a problem. There's not enough food. And there was a lot of hard work that was involved to see the work continue. In, in, in the portion of Scripture we read, it says, not, then they said, the place where we dwell is too straight for us. They said, let us go. We pray thee unto Jordan, and take thence every man a bean, and let us make a place there that we may dwell. And he answered, Go. So there was there was going to be a lot of work involved. It wasn't they weren't just going to call a builder in, and pay him all sorts of money that they had lying around to come and build them a nice new house. No, no. He said we're going to have to go down all the way down to Jordan, quite a journey. We're going to have, once we get there, we're going to have to find suitable trees. We're going to have to cut down the trees, and then every man is going to haul up a beam. And you can imagine this process was going to be repeated multiples of times. They were going to go down, cut down the trees, haul every person taking as, as large of a tree trunk as they possibly could carry. And then they were going to turn around and do the same thing again until they had enough wood. And then they were going to split the wood. And then they were going to straighten the wood. And then they were going to um, find nails and fasten the wood and build a house and put a roof on it and furnish it. There was 
a lot of hard work that was going to be involved. And let's be honest, as we have new workers and laborers who will be coming into our church here in a few weeks, there's going to be a lot of hard work involved. A lot of times people get the idea of, oh, you get these students that come to you um, from the Bible college and they're, they're free labor and you can just sit down over the next four months and you can put your feet up and they'll do all the work. And uh, I challenge you, if you think that's the case, um, come and uh, come and be with us for a weekend. Because what you'll find is it's actually, it's not free labor. It's, it, in many cases, it's the opposite. We have people in our church who are very faithfully working and laboring in the Sunday school or laboring in some other ministry. And now you have someone coming along and you have to tell them what to do and you have to help them know where to go and you you have to help them know how to do the right thing and why we do the right thing and you have to explain everything that you already know how to do again and again to someone else. And really in many cases it's more more work than you, you put more work into it and more time into it than you get out of it. It's a it's a lot of work. Even as a church, I, 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 I'm very thankful that everyone here is a church is very is very patient with your pastor. You know, during this time, I would love to spend as many days a week as I could here in Tisley, visiting and being involved in really doing pastoral work all, every day of the week. It'd be a wonderful thing. But I'm gone for a lot of the week, trying to train and trying to help, trying to encourage in many ways. It's a lot of work, isn't it? There's there's physical problems that arise. Let's be honest, there are maturity problems that arise when we have young people who some 18, 19 years old, They've never been away. Many of them have never been away from home and they're, they've never traveled to another country before. They've never, they, they're, they're lovely people with a good conscience. We trust that every person that would come over would always have, be well-intentioned and want to serve the Lord. But let's be honest, sometimes they're, they're not as grown up as they ought to be. Did you know the sons of the prophets were that way? You find a lot of immaturity issues. They didn't know what they're doing with this whole, we read the account of the pottage that they were doing. And the man went out to the the field and he gathered a bunch of poisonous gourds. And the Bible says he didn't know what he was doing. The boy never cooked a meal in his life. Didn't know the difference between a tomato and something poisonous. He just grabbed the first thing he did, cut it up, and threw it in the pot. It would have killed everybody. Didn't know how to cook, didn't know how to do things. Accidents happen. And accidents will happen. You know, they went down to the river and they started cutting down trees. And someone who had never, probably never handled an axe in his life, lost the axe head. And he was cutting a tree and in the middle of a swing, the axe head just came flying off. He didn't know how to secure it. He didn't know how to check it. He didn't know how to make sure it was tight onto the handle. Accidents happen. You find oftentimes that with maturity issues with young people that sometimes you find certain people might annoy you. Um, take your, the Word of God and turn back to chapter 2. The, the sons of the prophets are mentioned in nearly every chapter here. Chapter 2, verse number 1, It came to pass when the Lord would take Elijah up into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Verse number five. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came unto Elisha. And said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away my master from thy head today? 
And he answered it and said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. And they, they do this on a number of occasions. They come to Elisha and they told Elisha, they, they informed Elisha of things that he already knew. Don't you know, Elisha, they came to him? And he said, Yes, I know it. Hold your peace. They came to him a second time. And he said, look, I, I, I know that already. That's why I'm, I, I've, already I've already crossed that bridge. I've already come to that conclusion long before you did. Hold your peace. You don't need to tell me anymore. You, you almost get the idea of this portion of Scripture. They were being a bit of an annoyance. Here was a very special day. A day when Elijah was going to be gathered into heaven. Elisha, it was a, maybe a very, a very bittersweet and sad day emotional day for Elisha as he's determined he's going to stick with his master until the very end and here the sons of the prophets they get in the way and they're annoying and they're they're telling informing you of things that you already know and they're trying to tell you things that you you've already come to that conclusion long before they ever had and it happens that way and you may find, now I don't know who's going to be posted here or sitting here, you may find that you find someone that rubs you the wrong way a little bit. And they, be a, they can be a little annoying. And they, they come in to perhaps teach a Sunday school class and they're helping, really we're training them up, and they're trying to inform you of things that you already know or telling you how to do something that you already know how to do. And uh, really, classic signs, really, of, of a lack of maturity. And what you often find is being involved in a growing work, sometimes it seems like it's more trouble than it's worth. I wonder if Elisha thought that. He said, these sons of the prophets... They're, they come to me on the most, really, on, on the most somber day I have, and they're annoying me. And then I, I send them to go cook dinner, and they nearly kill everyone. And then I, I, we, the, now I have to, they filled up my house that used to be nice and empty, and they filled up my house, and they've eaten all my food, and we have to go down to the woods and cut a tree, and they can't even do that. They've lost the axe head that I borrowed from somebody. And now I've got to figure out what to do with that. Seems more trouble than it's worth sometimes. You know that many works of God are that way on the surface. They seem like they're more trouble than it's worth. And yet the Lord was in it. These, were, these, these sons of the prophets, you know what they were? They were the next generation of prophets and preachers. They had to be brought up. They had to be taught. And sometimes not even just taught how to preach, taught how to cook a pot of pottage, a pot of pottage. That's hard to say. Taught how to cut down a tree. They had to be taught. I, th I, I praise the Lord. I feel that's the case with some of the things God has given us but with a camp. You say, that was a lot of work. For two weeks of camp, and even on the last day of camp, some young people were complaining, and some people were doing this and that, and it, it was more trouble than it's worth. Well, wait a moment, there, there were young people there who were the next generation of preachers, the next generation of Christian teachers and Sunday school workers, the next generation of missionaries and church planters. They were right there at that place. I'm convinced of it. God's given us a Bible college. We're training people up to go and do the same things we're doing. And we've seen wonderful fruit of that this year, haven't we? As we've seen young couples sent to three different places in this country to see new work started. And so what do we need if we're going to be, there's problems that arise in a new work. What do we need? What's needed? You know, we need, we, we need God's borrowed power. It says in verse number 5, As they're there, Jordan, as one was felling a beam, an axe head fell into the water, and he cried and he said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. Many years ago, I heard a sermon by um, Ian Paisley, since passed away, and he 
preached, um, I was listening, it was a recording of it, and he preached on, he took this text and he preached about borrowed power. That there was a, not just a physical aspect to this, this story that we have, but a great spiritual a- aspect to it. The axe head was borrowed. And anyone, if you ever chop down a tree, you know that the power of an axe, it's not in the handle of it. It's in the head, isn't it? That's where the power is. And the power, in that instance, it was borrowed power. And I love how the man, when it fell into the water, he cried out. He said, alas. It was a cry of anguish. Why? Because he had lost the power that was given unto him. It was borrowed power. And what an encouragement when we think about it, that the power that we need, the strength, the energy, sometimes you just need energy. The strength and the energy and the provision that we need to be involved in a growing work of God does not and cannot come from within yourself. It cannot be a work that we do in our own strength. If it's a work that we can do in our own strength, there's no faith involved. And if there's no faith involved, it is impossible to please God. It's borrowed power. The power that we need comes from God. How important then, as children of God, if you know Christ is your Savior, how important is it, especially over the next weeks and months to come in the busyness of things, that you and I, it is important to maintain a close walk with God. And I hope it would be your desire to say this, I want the power of God on my life. I need the power of God in my life. I'm nothing without the power of God in my life. Borrowed power is needed. But what do we do when we lose it? You know, that happens from time to time in the Christian life. We get to walking in our own strength. We neglect to seek the Lord. We neglect to pray. We neglect to walk and to follow and obey the Lord as we should. And we suddenly realize we've lost God's power in our life. The Holy Spirit is not helping us. And we may be doing the same things, but we're like a man swinging an axe without a head on it. You can swing, you know, you can swing an axe handle without an axe head on it. You can swing it at a block of wood a hundred times, a thousand times. You can work up a sweat. You can lose all your energy, but you're not going to accomplish anything, are you? You might put a dent in the wood. You might put a scratch in the wood. You're not going to cut down the tree, though, are you? And if you feel in your life as if you've lost God's power in your life, God's presence in your life, I'd encourage you, don't keep swinging. Don't just keep carrying on as if nothing has happened. Don't be like Samson. You know, Samson, when his wife finally enticed him to give up the secret of his power, and she laid him down to sleep, and they brought in a barber, and they cut off the locks of his hair, and then she woke him up, and she said, The Philistines are come upon you. And the Bible says something interesting. The Bible says he shook himself as before. You can imagine him getting up and stretching out and thinking, that's it. Maybe he cracked his knuckles, something along those lines, and he thought, that's it. I've beat the Philistines before. I'll beat him again. And the Bible says he did not realize that the power of God was departed from him. And he went forth to meet his enemies, but he went forth as a powerless person. And we all know the the grave and the terrible uh, consequences that happened as a result. We don't want to be that way. We do not want to carry on. We don't want to go into the battle, as it were, or into the work, into the labor, without God's borrowed power. So don't keep swinging. And something else you shouldn't do, don't go home. Many people, if they're laboring and they feel as if God's power is not with them and they're not seeing God's help as they, as they used to know it. And God's encouragement as they used to know it. You know what they do? They say, that's it. I'm hanging up my axe handle. I've lost the head. The handle's no good. I'm, that's it. I'm calling it a day. I'm going home. It must have been God's will for us to build this new house. Many people come to that conclusion. 
what must be done? Well, I love what the man of God says here, verse number 6. And the man of God said, where fell it? That's a great question to ask. Well, where did it fall? You know, it's a good thing to do if you feel as if you've lost the power of God or your walk with God is not as it should. Ask this question, where did I lose it? At what point of time? At what place? And what you'll often find is there was a specific moment, a specific decision, a specific attitude, whatever it was. And I can't give you that answer, but you can search your heart and ask the Lord to reveal to you, where fell it? That's a great question. Go back to where it fell. In the Pilgrim's Progress, Christian was on his way up the hill difficulty. And there was a little place that was, that was constructed about halfway up the hill where pilgrims could rest for a few moments. So the, the story goes on that he goes to rest. Rather than resting for a few moments, he got lazy. And he fell asleep and he tarried there for many hours longer than he should. And when he awoke, it was the middle of the night. And in his haste, he got up and he began to ran up the hill, but he forgot his scroll that was given to him. And you know what? He realized it when he got towards the top of the hill. Do you know what he had to do? He had to go back to where he lost it. And that was difficult. It was hard. It was in the middle of the night in the hill Now that was very difficult. And the day was extremely difficult in the night. And he had to go and search for it on his hands and his knees until he found it. But he had to go back to where he lost it. Go back to where it fell. He said, where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither. And the iron did swim. What a great miracle was wrought here. The man went back to where it fell. And God worked a miracle. He made the iron swim. This is a, a, a great picture. Many people believe this is a great picture, Old Testament picture of the resurrection. Something that, is, that was dead, that was unretrievable made alive and brought to the surface. And the Bible says this, Therefore he said, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and he took it up. And you can imagine him taking it up and with great force and confidence putting it back on the axe handle, giving it a couple of taps and going, and going out to fell his beam. Go back to where it fell and then ask the Lord to do a, re, a, a rejuvenating work in your heart. Say, Lord, I, I feel like I'm dead. Make me alive again. Do a miracle in my heart. And the Lord is able to do that. And what a wonderful thing. Pray and God's power might be restored in your life. Why? So that God's work can continue. Don't keep swinging. Don't go home. Go back to where it fell and pray for the Lord to restore you and to raise you up and to fill you once again with His power and with His Spirit. Why? So you can continue in His work. So we can continue the work that God's given us. And so may God help us. What, are, what should we do over the next few weeks and days to come? What should we do? Well, let's pray for every laborer. And the Lord may send someone or you may have to deal or work with people sometimes you don't always get along with. Good, pray for them. You know, it'd, it'd be silly if you ever always only ever had to work with people you got along with you. That wouldn't be much, wouldn't be much of a challenge, would it? No, pray for them. Let's encourage every worker that God sends our way. I, I, by, my, by God's grace, I want, I want every, every person that ever comes here through this church to leave encouraged than when they came in, to leave more helped than when they came in, to leave more trained up in the Word of God and in the work of God than when they came, to leave empowered by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit in that they can take the same work that they've, that they've been engaged in here and they could take that same work and do it anywhere. That's what we want. Let's pray for, let's encourage every labor. Let's rejoice in every opportunity God gives us. And you know, you do not have to personally do every work that we are involved in. 
Sometimes we feel that way. They say, oh, I, I need to be involved in the homeless outreach and I've got to work at the camp and I have to be involved in this and I've got to do that and I've got to do that. It is physically, I, I, I had to come to this conclusion many years ago. It is physically impossible to be involved in everything that is going on. You cannot do it. There aren't enough hours in the day. There's not enough strength in your hands. You're, it, it cannot be done. You don't have to do it all. That's why a church exists, right? We all labor in different areas. We all labor in different things. You don't have to do it all. But please, can you do this? Can you rejoice in it all? Can you rejoice in every work of God? And rejoice that God has given us these little growing pains, these little growing problems. You know, we could have the opposite problem. And I praise God every day that we don't have the opposite problem. We could be trying to figure out who to sell our chapel to. We could be trying to figure out, you know, hey, we, we've got this crown hall, but we don't have any students, and now we've got bills to pay and no way to pay them, and we have to go around the country and beg for people to come in or beg for people to donate so we can keep this historic building alive. I'm thankful we don't have that problem, right? We could have the opposite problem, but God has been good to us and gracious to us. And so let's pray the Lord to help us in the midst of growing pains, in the midst of problems of a growing ministry. May the Lord help us and give us a desire to be filled with His power. And may we know the Lord's help and grace every step of the way. Let's pray together. How we thank Thee, our gracious God, for Thy Word, for the examples of Thy Word. We thank Thee that in times past, that holy men of God, like Elijah and Elisha, were willing and able to help and to encourage and train up these sons of the prophets, and that we enjoy a continue, an, an unbroken and continued line of God's people helping and training up the next generation of workers and laborers. Help us to be a part of that great work, we pray. Encourage us and we pray that in the annoyances and in the problems and the difficulties, help us to keep our eyes upon Thee. Help us to search our hearts and to know, have enough spiritual discernment, we pray, Heavenly Father, to know when we are not walking right with Thee and we do not have Thy Spirit resting upon us. And to once again seek Thy face. We're thankful Thou art gracious, full of compassions, full of forgiveness. Do help us, we pray, in the days and the weeks to come. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books together this evening. Let's sing a closing hymn. Hymn 545. Hymn 545. Jesus, and shall it ever be, a mortal man ashamed of thee, ashamed of thee whom angels praise whose glory shine through endless days. <coughs> Jesus, and shall it ever be a mortal man ashamed of thee, ashamed of thee, whom angels praise, whose glory shine through endless days. Ashamed of Jesus, soon afar, let evening blush to own a star. He shed the beams of light divine, or this benighted soul of mine. Ashamed of Jesus, just as soon 
Let midnight be ashamed of noon. Twas midnight with my soul till he bright morning star they darkness flee ashamed of jesus that dear friend on whom my hopes of have depend no when i blush be this my shame that i no more revere his name ashamed of jesus yes i may when i've no guilt to wash away no tear to wipe no good to crave no fears to quell no soul to save till then nor is my boasting vain till then i boast a savior slain and oh may this my glory be that Christ is not ashamed of me. Well, let's stand and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer this evening. Let's remember to pray for one another. And we know the Lord will uphold and keep us as his people. I'd like to ask Mr. Iveson, would you mind to pray for us as we dismiss this evening? Amen.